All right, guys, uh, welcome to the Zoom for this week. Um, haven't got much to uh, smile about if you're a Crows, Port or England supporter, but um, at least Ash Barty did the job for us. So um, good weekend of footy, um, not too many issues. Um, there's only one thing I need to mention before we get on to our special guest, and that is uh, for those in their first, second, third year with the league, need to bring a whistle to training this week. Uh, we've got our skill drills night. So uh, if you're in that group, make sure you, you bring your whistle along and be prepared to do some skill drills. All right. Uh, we have a real treat tonight. Um, this year we have had um, the pleasure of speaking to uh, Lenny Gluftus, uh, Lee Housen, Curtis Boy. Uh, that's three of the four South Australian field umpires on the AFL panel. And tonight we get to meet and speak to the fourth one. And uh, he set a record last year for being the very first South Australian field umpire to do an AFL grand final. So um, it's going to be a great chat. I did have the honour of umpiring with him many years ago uh, in his early days. Um, but he's gone on to much bigger and better things. And uh, he's agreed to take his... Uh, take some time aside to speak to us tonight. So Craig, uh, Craig Flair, did you want to unmute yourself, mate, and come on to the call? Easy done. Thanks for the intro, Colin. You missed one, though. You missed Jamie Broadbent. We've got five. Ah, well done. Thank you. There's, there's another one I'll have to uh, I'll have to get on. Yeah, of course, he's just got on this year. So, yeah, well done. Um, now, actually, I did mention I did use did umpire with you. I do tell this story a bit when your name comes up. I remember saying to someone late in my sample career that uh, when we used to come in at quarter time, half time, three quarter time and talk about the decisions that had gone on during a game, I reckon there was a number one person I would rate for their, uh, for their opinion on the decisions and that was you. I I've always thought your decision making was extremely strong and um, obviously you've gone on to bigger and better things. So let's, let's tell us, um, let's hear about your story. So just tell us, uh, how it all unfolded for you? Uh, well, going back to the very beginning in my career was 2000 was when I first started umpiring and started umpiring the Glenelg school zone under Kevin Wallace. And we trained with the, uh, with the West Adelaide school zone as well. We were under Jeff Jeans and we used to train at, uh, at Sacred Heart College, which was uh, brilliant for me. It was relatively close to home. Um, and so I was there for three years and both Kevin and Jeff James were fantastic mentors and, and guiders in my early days. Uh, and from there, went out to independent schools uh, under, um, oh, crikey, his name slips me now, John Rogers. I shouldn't let that name slip. Um, under John Rogers. Um, and was there for a season before being invited out to the Sandful under 17s uh, panel it was back then and spent quite a few years at the juniors in the 17s and 19s, 19s at the Sandful. Had a few injuries and probably a few too many uh, beers and and, uh, and whiskeys on the Saturday nights and that didn't quite help my cause. But uh, from there, managed to work my way up through the league footy up in 2009. It's my first league game. And then... Uh, was fortunate enough in 2012 to be promoted to the AFL list um, while still living in Adelaide, which was uh, brilliant. And then come the end of 2014, had a fairly big setback um, where I was delisted from the AFL and came back to the SANFL for 2015 and umpired a, a season there before being re-promoted to the AFL list for, for 2016. And I've been there since and obviously had a very... Uh, an amazing year last year. It was an extraordinary year for many reasons, but uh, personally to have gotten through to a grand final is just uh, incredible. So it's been a, a long journey. If I, if I look at it that way, it's been 20 years from starting to get to an AFL grand final. So it was a, a lengthy journey, but that pales into insignificance to the length of journeys that some of the guys on this uh, Zoom call will have had with their umpiring careers. But um, it's certainly not a quick thing to get to uh, AFL and then AFL grand finals. And so that year that you got uh, demoted, um, there was a bit of a story to that. I think that was the year that they asked all the field umpires to go back or go to Melbourne to live. Is that right? Is that was that part of the reason why that all happened? 
Yeah, so that was, look, that's obviously not the reason that they gave because um, they they weren't able to give that as the reason, but uh, that was certainly one of the... Um, one of the sticking points that they uh, that I wouldn't agree to move to Melbourne because I had some family issues that needed to be sorted. Um, so I, I elected to say no, that I wouldn't move to Melbourne until these family things were sorted out. And then uh, they got resolved through 2015. And then uh, when the phone call came in 2000, well, at the end of 2015, asking me if I could move across to Melbourne, I was in a position to be able to do so. And they, uh, they re-offered me my position on the list. So obviously pretty um, uh, tough to take at the time, that, that decision. Uh, how, did, how did you cope with it? Uh, and I guess um, looking back on it, what, 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 was, what was the good about it that helped you in the long run? Uh, look, it was certainly, um, it was a very bitter pill to swallow. I think it took me, uh, I reckon it took me, three or four months after the phone call before I actually watched another AFL game. Um, so it, it actually took a little while to, for, for the grieving process, if you want to call it that, to actually um, be finished. Um, and, and I was extremely fortunate because there were still things that I wanted to achieve uh, at the Sandful. So I, I got onto the AFL list probably in a more unusual manner. Most people would do two or three Sample grand finals before being promoted to the AFL list, but I um, I managed to sneak through after only sitting a bench for a, for a sample grand final. So I had an umpire to sample grand final, so I still had things that I wanted to achieve, which um, I think was a, a major factor in me being positive and and not just dwelling for too long on the negative being dropped from the AFL. And, um, I mentioned your strong decision making ability early days, um, you kind of touched on it just then. One thing you weren't well known for in early days was your fitness or, your, or I guess your uh, resilience with injuries. You seem to be struck down with injuries all the time. So I guess that's something you've had to develop um, now that you're on the AFL, like I guess your fitness and your ability to um, keep yourself uninjured. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny how it's probably more of just a growing up thing more than anything else. Um, you know, when I was younger, I, I didn't have any serious injuries. I just had a lot of tendonitis issues and I would always try and get that completely right before trying to go out and run again. Um, and I guess now as I've gotten a bit older and I don't know whether it's smarter or dumber, but, um, you find ways to just work through it and you realize you don't actually need, you're never going to be a hundred percent. We're a lot like footballers, um, particularly as we start to age a little bit, you're always going to have a little niggle. And it's all about how you manage that and how you actually work through games to get the job done. Um, whereas when I was a bit younger, it was the opposite. I was like, no, I need to be 100% fit before I go out there. So it's probably more of a mindset shift than anything else. And, you know, just not suffering from a bit of soft cockitis. <laughs> I won't say we called you that, but potentially you it may have been mentioned um but yeah no it's uh, good to see you to get through that stage so um how many afl games have you done so far and tell us about your afl journey because um yeah you've been there a few years now yeah i've uh, somehow managed to get through to nine seasons which um this year when they put us into our personal development groups and my name got listed on the uh, on the seniors list as so the nine plus. So it came as a bit of a shock to me. Um, but uh, so I'm up to uh, I think 150 odd games now. Um, so it's it's a slow process. Um, if you think about 20, you know, approximately 20 games a season, um, and this is my ninth season. I should be up 180 to 200, but uh, a few uh, a few poorer performances might uh, might have you sitting out on the sidelines in the early days but um so yeah, it's been it's been quite a journey the first three years like i mentioned were were in adelaide um and the biggest challenge with that was we didn't really have much of a, a support group in adelaide the afl hadn't quite worked out how to um to really cater and 
uh, look after the interstate umpires, you know, because there was guys in Perth, there were still guys in Queensland, I think, at that stage, and South Australians. Um, yeah, and they hadn't come up with a solution as to how to look after us all from you know, remotely, and that's hence why the move to Melbourne came about. Um, they wanted everyone to be in the same spot. Uh, they can get the same coaching, the same treatment, uh, same training sessions. So that's how that all came about. Um, it was pretty exciting. I, uh, I was lucky enough to umpire the first game at the redeveloped Adelaide Oval, so the first showdown there. Um, got the first bounce as well. There was a bit of controversy about that. The, uh, the other two guys who I was umpiring with had no idea that apparently I'd said that I was going to take the first bounce regardless of what they said. So that was actually an untrue story. They just made that up, but um, they ran with it anyway. Um, so that was, a, that was an amazing experience to, to run out there for the first time at a the first game since it's been redeveloped and the the noise in that stadium is just extraordinary it's still uh it's still the best stadium uh that we've got i think in the country um and i don't think it'll take a lot to actually surpass it um then uh so moving on from there to 2016 and the relocation to melbourne it's it's been a it's been a really great experience um obviously it was what was required of me to uh, to continue my AFL career um, and we've we've absolutely loved our time here we we've moved up into the hills so we've moved as far away from Melbourne as we possibly can even though we live in Melbourne um, and it just reminds us of, of Adelaide um, which is why we moved up here it's just it's a beautiful part of the world and um, that's actually helped me greatly with my mindset rather than being stuck in the big city in Melbourne as much as Melbourne's a cool city it's not how we want to live. Um, so I'm probably an hour from the city, which is uh, a bit of a hike when you think about Adelaide terms where you can get everywhere in 30 minutes, but um, it's, it's a fair hike for me to get anywhere, but it's, uh, it's been the best thing for the mindset, which when you're having to back up week after week for AFL footy, 90% of it's actually in your head. So if, you, if you're not able to get your head right, you're going to struggle to get your decisions right. So um, yeah, it's, it's actually been an amazing experience to be here and to, to be a part of the big group has been fantastic. And you learn so much from, from the older guys. You know, we talk about the Stevics and the Merediths and Roseberries. You, you learn a great deal from being around them uh, at training and just catching up with them generally as well. Um, and the thing that we all have, as elders, I guess, if we want to use those words in, in imparting knowledge onto the young guys is we all want to give them as much knowledge as possible. And ultimately we want them to grow to become really good umpires as well. So everyone's got that ability in them and the want to do that. And it's just a matter for the young guys to really want to seek that out and grow and want to learn. So the, um, the, the rumour is that in the not-too-distant future, there is a possible chance that you might uh, be able to come back and live in uh, Adelaide. Is that something that you would like to do at some stage? Yeah, the rumour mill goes pretty quickly around umpiring circles, doesn't it? It's, uh, no, it's certainly uh, a possibility, and the, um, the aim at this stage is for a few of us to move back at the end of this season. So... Um, that's that's certainly our plan, and a couple of others have jumped on board on the back of me trying to organise this and get it sorted for them. But um, yeah, well, uh, there'll be a few of us moving back at the end of this season. Oh, that would be awesome for the the young umpires coming through the ranks over here too. Um, so let's get on to last year, like a, a difficult year for everyone um, with COVID coming along and lockdowns and relocations. Um, how did that unfold for you? Did you have to move away from Melbourne for long? Uh, yeah, just a little while. It was four and a half months we were away in the end. Um, so we, we came back home and looked like someone had been playing Jumanji in our back, backyard because we just hadn't been here. Um, look, it was, um, it was an extraordinary year. Um, it, it's really hard to describe uh, like the, the varying emotions you had throughout the, the season. Um, you know, the, the first game where the crowds got shut out and so we're umpiring in front of no one was was weird I think I had um I had the game in Adelaide round one and even the flight across 
there, I think there was five people on our flight. It was just extraordinary. It, there was just no one. It was everything was a ghost town. It was um, a really bizarre experience. And then obviously the the lockdown and the shutdown of the season came for nearly uh, two months. I think it was in the end. And I was uh, one of the umpires that put the hand up to go into quarantine for 14 days up in the Barossa Valley so that the showdown could happen for round two. And that that little two week period was one of the most. It, it was one of the most brilliant two week periods I can remember ever having. It was we had so much fun. It was Matt Nichols, uh, Lee Housen, and myself. And we made the most of every single second we spent in that quarantine. It was just absolutely brilliant. And it was really unusual. And we did what we had to do to enable the game to go ahead. But it was uh, it was exceptional. And I, I can't speak highly enough of the character of everyone that's been involved with those sorts of things. Because while it's unusual, we all just get in and we just do it. And we make the most of every single second we've got. Um, so then there was that the uh, the police of our, the police officer that stopped us at the border when we had to roll through and give them our exemption to say yes we are actually allowed to travel in here he he made it clear to us that he would only let us in if the crows won um, that didn't quite work out for him quite clearly I think for something from memory but um, it's amazing how you know people just recognise you straight away for those sorts of things and they've all got their opinion so that's um, that's all good. Um, and then obviously we had a few weeks in Melbourne where we had games in front of limited crowds and and then uh, and then things really went sour in, in Melbourne and I had I had 12 hours notice to pack my bags and leave, um, which was uh, not not ideal to be honest. So I was on a flight, I think it was 3 p.m. on a on a Friday and then 7 a.m. Saturday I was out. So um, the challenge for me was what to do with the family. Uh, that was every decision that I made last year was how it would impact them. Um, and what we ended up deciding is that Sarah Jane and Scarlett would actually drive um, to Canberra. So I would, I'd, I'd go to the airport and they would then drive on to Canberra to be with Sarah Jane's parents. And then once I'd sussed out the accommodation where we were staying in Sydney, I'd say, the way on you stay there in Canberra with your parents and the AFL to their credit were um, what they provided for the umpiring group uh, in terms of accommodation and facilities last year. Um, apparently my internet connection is unstable. Hope you can still hear me. Um, <laughs> it frees up uh, I thought it might have been mine but it's, yeah you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, the AFL were fantastic. And the accommodation that we had in Sydney to start with for three weeks before we then got relocated to the Gold Coast um, was was fantastic. And uh, everyone had asked me about last year, they they sort of asked, you know, so what was it like being in a hub? And it was an it was an amazing experience because never before and never again are we going to have that many umpires in one space. And constantly there day on day week on week um, and the relationships that we built uh, between not only field umpires but also boundary and goal umpires was was absolutely amazing um, it's just you, you don't get those opportunities to create relationships and really good valuable relationships like that um, it helped that we were you know in a in the sunshine 24 seven rather than stuck in the Victorian winter. So that also helped. Um, but the, the overall experience was, was fantastic. Um, I, I must admit that I got to, uh, I got to the end of the season. So the end of the minor round and I was certainly ready to come home. Um, I think by that stage, it had been two and a half, three months and we were we were definitely ready to come home. We were missing having our our space because we were just in apartments up on the Gold Coast, um, and we've got a, a large property here, so we missed having our space and having the garden and having the trees. But um, so the last month, as much as it was finals time and as much as it was brilliant that I got to by a grand final, that last month felt like three months extra on top of how long we were away. Um, it was just an unusual set of circumstances, I guess, throughout the season. We were rolling from game to game, you know, so we're doing games every four or five days. Um, 
whereas come finals time, you had the, the pre-finals buy. So that was a long fortnight of not doing much at all other than training. Um, and then obviously you're back to normal for, for finals games where it's one game a week. So it, it did drag on a little bit. And it's, that's probably the only negative I can say about last year is that it did drag on for the last month. But overall, the hub experience was um, was absolutely brilliant. And I wouldn't want to do it again, but it was a great experience. Yeah, so it was almost like being a full-time umpire, wasn't it? So uh, what do you normally do for work? Uh, so I'm an electrician. I've got my own electrical business up here that uh, just kicks along in the background. Nice. Very good. So um, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to do that last year, obviously, up, uh, up on the Gold Coast. So I had to shut the business down for the length of time that we were, we were away. Yeah. So let's tell us, uh, tell us about the grand final, mate. Not, not only the game, but the build-up. And I guess um, you would have been flooded with congratulations and people wanting to kind of, um, you know, let you know how happy they were for you. It, it, that must have been somewhat surreal. Yeah, it was, um, it was an amazing experience. Like, you, you work hard for a, a lot of years and we, we obviously have the end goal of wanting to go and play an AFL grand final, but the reality is not many actually get there. And, you know, I went through the first week of finals and I'm like, okay, I think I've had an okay season. I, I reckon I've gone okay the first week of finals. And then obviously the list for finals gets cut from 12 down to six for the second week of finals. And, and once I got that phone call to say, oh yeah, you've progressed to the second week. I'm like, oh, okay. I wonder where your mind starts playing games with you. You're like, okay, now I'm in the top six and so now I might actually be a chance to get the grand final. But, um, you know, the phone call for the actual grand final was, probably one of the funniest stories. I was actually on the golf course um, and well, I wasn't expecting a phone call until later on in the afternoon. So a few of us that were still there had organized to go out and play golf just to kill the morning because uh, we didn't want to be sitting around waiting for a phone call. And, uh, and then on the second hole, we, uh, we all got phone calls. So uh, the golf took a back seat after that. It was, um, I remember someone asked me how I played after that, if I played better or worse. And I just said, I couldn't tell you. I don't even remember the game of golf from there on. Um, so the first couple of days were, were really busy with, um, like you said, congratulations messages from, from hundreds of people. It was incredible, the amount of people. And, and how people actually find your phone number as well. I'd love to know how some of these people actually got my phone number. But... Um, I was going to blame you for a few of them. That's for sure. Um, no, but it was amazing. Just the, the support from, from people that you've grown up, uh, you know, in your umpiring journey with so from coaches, you know, I think Kevin Wallace and Jeff and um, you know, John Rogers. And then I think Mick Humphreys as well. Like there were just a stack of coaches that have helped me in my journey that reached out to send me a message. It was, it was absolutely, it was really humbling, actually. I, I, I didn't think that many people would, would care about it, to be honest. But um, it was uh, it was amazing, the support. And the first couple of days with responding to those messages, I, I hope I didn't forget anyone in my responses, but there were that many I could well have, I could well have forgotten a few people. Um, and that combined with, uh, with a bit of media stuff as well, um, I was actually quite surprised with how much media stuff there was, I guess, um, because nothing was happening in Melbourne and footy was the only thing that anyone cared about while they were in the lockdown here. There was, there was actually a real want for, for us to go on media, which surprised me. Um, but then thankfully come Thursday and Friday, everything really settled down. Um, uh, from what I hear, Thursday and Friday, traditionally for the AFL Grand Final are really busy days. So I think there's lunches and dinners and then the grand final parade. Um, so thankfully, because none of that was going on, um, it was uh, it felt more like a normal game. So it, that helped me with my mindset to be ready for it. Um, and the other thing is we actually had to pack up all our stuff from the apartment on the Gold Coast to move to Brisbane. So... Um, it was uh, that helped us. It was like moving house after being there for three months. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. And then the game the game day was weird because um, we literally we jumped on a bus from the Gold Coast to Brisbane that morning and checked into some accommodation and then virtually straight onto a bus to the Gabba. Um, so 
it was it was a bizarre sort of leap into a game. There was nothing normal about it. Um, so the game was just fantastic, though the the atmosphere, the night grand final. I'm kind of disappointed the AFL haven't um, haven't kept going with a night or twilight grand final. From what I can gather, the the experience was was brilliant. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit shattered. I'd I'd like to know your thoughts about that, Colin. I I thought it was a great idea having a night grand final. Actually, what do you think yeah, about uh, that? I, it came across well, mate, and. Um... It was a great spectacle. I'm, I'm, I'm either, either way. I'm not really that fast. I am interested if um, we had Lee Housen on earlier this year, and he made a smart Alec comment where, right near the end of the um, of the Zoom when he heard you were coming on, and and he made some wise crack. And we just had a little message sent to everyone. And I just wonder whether he's on the line because. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I might just have to do some investigations. If it's not Lee Housen, <laughs> I want he's worded up to send a message to bag you, but uh, we'll ignore that one. Um, uh, I'm going to open up the line for people to ask questions. We've got about 10 minutes left, uh, and um, I'm sure we've got some guys here that want to come on and uh, ask questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask Craig a question, just unmute yourself. Yeah, mate. Um, my oh, name... Andre. Andre. Yes, you mate. Need be, you need to be better than last time, mate. When you got when you came on and asked Eleni about um, having a statue made for art, um, we don't want any more of those questions. Thanks. Okay, I was alluding to some sort of honour and all that, but now you've indicated that I'll uh, ask a proper question then. Um, uh, yeah, congratulations on your stellar career. career. Um, I've, I've been in the gig for a couple of years, an up and coming uh, umpire star. And um, the question is, is just what criteria uh, do they look at when, when they do select, you know, um, an umpire to do, you know, the, the, the creme of the creme, the blue ribbon event uh, being a grand final? What is it? I mean, how many, uh, the percentage of errors or um, is it a voting system? <laughs> I wish it was a voting system. That might make things a bit, uh, a bit more clearer, but uh, ultimately it, it's, a reward for a body of work, I guess. And it's not necessarily just a particular season. It, it's probably an accumulation of your performances over a, over a few seasons. Um, so it all kind of factors in. So decision-making is obviously the, a massive part of it. Um, but it's not just going well for one year and coming out with the, with the chocolates. It's actually it's the accumulation of doing decisions well, uh, your skills well, uh, your one team, so looking after your teammates, your communication. So it's the combination of all the factors that we're assessed on over a period of a period of time that uh, that ultimately gets you the reward and doing those consistently week in week out at, at a high level. Is the strength on that purely on the actual umpiring uh, panel and other umpires, or is it feedback also from from coaches of the teams that you umpire? Oh, God. <laughs> I uh, I dare imagine if the coaches of teams had any say in what umpires uh, were selected from grand finals, I I think most of us would be eliminated immediately. But um, no, ultimately it's just uh, it's just the coaches that observe us week in week out from games. They they give us reviews every week of our key competencies um, and how well we've gone in those areas, and uh, and they then meet. Um, with everyone, oh, they meet as a coaching group on a Wednesday to then collaborate and go through every umpire's performance through uh, through the weekend. So, as a as a coaching group, they're all over everything and everyone that's on the list and and how they've performed from week to week. So it's uh, it's a job that I certainly never want to have to do. That's for sure. It seems too full on for me. Okay, thanks, Mark. All good. All right, next. Jeez, normally we get swamped. I'll have a go. I, I reckon uh, um, watching the game, I can't remember last week, the week before, I think I saw, um, is it Matt um, Konechko? Is that his name? Boundary umpire? Boundary umpire, yeah. Yeah, I think I was, did I see him counting players in a zone at the end of it between goals? Is that something boundary yeah. umpires do? Is there yeah, anything else uh, that sort of different that you guys or the boundary umpires in, at the AFL do? behind the scenes, little jobs like that, that we might not see normally? Um, 
that's probably the uh, the major ones, particularly boundary umpires. So their their responsibility is to count the, the players in the zone. Um, obviously, with the AFL having the six six six, I'm not sure if you guys have introduced that or not. No, but, no we uh, don't. We keep it simple. Yeah, and I think that's a smart way to do it. But given the uh, given the six six six, that that's the boundary umpire's job to count how many players are in the zone, and then if there's any issues, then they can run across and tell us. Um, so that we're all over it, but ultimately that's that's probably the main difference uh, in between goals that you that you may notice. We actually, uh, I don't know if anyone watched the Western Bulldog Sydney game from yesterday, but we actually had a goal umpire pay two breaches for a player that uh, walked out of the goal square um, prior to a ball being bounced. And I think, as far as I know, they're the first two that have ever been done in an AFL game, and they both happened in the same game and it was quite extraordinary we heard the whistle we actually thought it was someone in the crowd that had a whistle it was uh, it was a bizarre experience all right so the the um uh, i my suspicion is correct we've got lee Housen um tuning in to have a listen because <laughs> he did he did say when i said we were coming on he said oh craig flea he's so boring uh, very tongue in cheek, and then we got this message on chat saying, "How boring is this bloke?" And that made me think. I wonder what it is. And then he's just commented again to the group: "All the good umpires wear single-digit numbers." Uh, in <laughs> someone else asking, "What number do you have?" So that's obviously Lee on the line to stir things up. Um, so the, quest, the serious question from Cliff was, "What number do you wear?" So just let everyone know. Oh, that's, I'm glad that you don't know what number I wear. It means you, that I've gone unnoticed. Now, number twenty-six. Um, all right, next next question. Lee, you can unmute yourself and come on and, and say good day if you like. Yeah, stop trying to uh, prank call me as well, Housie. It's all right, Craig, I've got a question for you. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <That> worries me. <laughs> uh, uh, you've done a number of grand finals across State League and the AFL. Uh, which one was your favourite and why was it the 2007 Under-17s Grand Final? <laughs> oh, goodness no, me. Tell everyone the story. Obviously, there's a story behind that one. Oh, we umpired it together. So, um, it's, isn't Gee. it funny? I actually walked, I walked off that day, off the Oval that day, thinking that that was the last game of football I was going to umpire because I'd had little, those little injury issues and, uh, and I thought to myself, yep, I've come back. I've umpired the 17th grand final with Forster. I'm, I'm a happy man. I can leave my career here. And that, that is actually a true story. Um, I don't know who I can thank for keeping me going, but uh, I'm not sure it was you, Forster, because we would have uh, been out drinking. But Definitely wasn't me. <laughs> Haven't have their careers gone in um, different, uh, different uh, directions since that grand final? Uh, I don't. <laughs> It's incredible. I, I remember one of my favourite stories with Forster. He was struggling with his bouncing a few times throughout his career. And there was one day at Woodville where I, where I suggested to him that he needs to, because he just wasn't staying down long enough over his, over his bounce. And so I remind, I just said to him, Forster, there's a, there's a shot of vodka on the centre circle there for you. Every time you get down, you need to take a sip out of that shot of vodka and you, you'll bounce the ball straight. I can't remember if you kept shanking him after that, but that was my little piece of advice for him. <laughs> and whatever you do, Craig, mate, you're uh, magnificent to watch as a bouncer. That is a true strength of yours. Do you ever put one off? I, I can't remember seeing you ever do a bad bounce. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, definitely put them off. Uh, opening bounce this year for Richmond and Carlton was a bit of a stinker, but, um, you know, look, it's... Uh, I am lucky enough that my action just seems to get through really well and really consistently. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it was a lot of practice. Um, <laughs> Housen is definitely having a crack at you here now. <laughs> you yeah, no, I, you're getting the, you're getting the <laughs> as well. Yeah. No, he's, he's starting to, I, I can actually remove him from this uh, Zoom anyway, which I might need to. Hey, uh, we've got about uh, three minutes left. Is anyone else, um, we've got time for one or two more questions. Anyone else before I'll uh, I'll ask one? I'll go. I'll, I can go again if you want, Colin. Go, mate. <laughs> serious um, one? Uh, not really. Uh, um, let me. If it's not serious, I've got a serious one to ask it. Craig, living in Melbourne, um, and 
and and when you come back to Adelaide, you would start to get recognised um, in the street. Like uh, you're at becoming well known. How, how do you find that these days? Oh, I tell you, hopefully I don't get recognised. I, I must admit though, when I was there, it was either earlier this year or last year. I walked into the Woolworths in Rundle Mall and. And, and the security guard there said, make sure the Crows win today. And I'm thinking, how the bloody hell do you know who I am? So, it, you know, ultimately we we don't do anything to, to get noticed, but I guess a, a football supporter might notice us. Um, and ultimately we just have to have a laugh and just be human with them because that's, that's all we are. And, um, you know, ultimately we just know they're football supporters and we love the game as much as they do. So hopefully they understand that. Yeah, look, and... You're always going to have one umpire on the list that to, to takes the attention more than you, no matter what you do. So Ray saves you from a bit of that attention. Um, I've got a question from Iggy. Uh, how far do you run on average in an AFL game? Too far. Um, 13 to 14 kilometres is our average per game. Yeah, too far. Wait, you've never been a big lover of running, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, mate. Um, Time is is up. Thank you so much for um, um, spending your time today to speak to us. Uh, we are really proud of you. Um, that grand final you umpired exceptionally well, and um, we know that uh, it's very likely that's not going to be your last. So we'll uh, keep following you um, and hope to see you back here one day uh, living here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, all the best. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, Great, Craig, and uh, to everyone else, we look forward to um, seeing you on. <laughs> Lee's just asking when are we going to get a good guest on. Well, Lee, we'll ask you back uh, soon, soon enough. Uh, we'll see you all on Wednesday night, and we'll be back at the Zoom next week. Cheers.